Good evening, Twitch. Hello, YouTube. Welcome to Birth of a World. How's everybody doing tonight? So for anyone new to this stream, um, this is a live interactive show. Uh, Good evening, so, Twitch. Hello, YouTube. whoa. Welcome. Apologies for that. I had the volume on my Twitch monitor, so that was starting to loop back. Anyway, um, where was I? Yes. So this evening's... Uh, so anyone new to the show who's watching, this is an interactive podcast. If you're logged into Twitch, feel free to join the chat. Um, you'll get to ch I'll be asking the chat questions. You can make suggestions, ask, quest ask me questions, things like that. It's go back and forth kind of thing. Um, so with that out of the way, uh, a bit of recap. We've been working, or I've been working on this uh, for a while now as a new campaign setting for a uh, fifth edition campaign that I plan to run with my normal Pathfinder group at some point. Uh, we're currently working on fleshing out kind of the the regions around where the action is taking place. Um, we've outlined the first three or so adventures, uh, detailing first the experiences in a town called Tincliff, and then traveling onward into the neighboring region called Kazal. Uh, here we've drawn it out in very, very low resolution kind of Settlers of Catan blocks just to help figure out what the terrain is like. On tonight's stream, we're going to be talking about creating cities. Uh, the next piece of the action that the players are going to experience is they're going to be traveling into the city of Vrasta Kazal, um, where they will uh, have their next adventure. And so we're going to need to create both the city of Vrasta and also another location uh, in the neighboring countryside, a smaller settlement, uh, that will be the site of the actual third adventure, which is where they will um, be dealing with the first indication that something has gone terribly wrong uh, with the world that they're in. Uh, and where we'll really start kicking off the central plot thread of this campaign. So, uh, cities, here we go. So I, before the stream, I actually took the time to uh, write out a checklist for kind of all the different pieces of information I want to come up with when I'm going to create a settlement. Now, your syst whatever system you're using, be it uh, Pathfinder, 5th edition, 4th edition, 2nd edition, not D&D at all, whatever um, system, you'll probably have a set of rules defining how to build a settlement. And I'm going to focus, instead of instead of focusing too much on the rules information, on like things like uh, purchasing limit and information like that, I'm going to focus more on coming up with the feel and kind of the experience of what the city is like to help, uh, a, camp to help a campaign author such as myself uh, really define what's going on in the city and to create create plot threads that can become side quests or later get mixed in with the uh, overarching story. So before tonight's stream, I actually went through and just filled in this checklist for a location for my other campaign setting from Terra uh, In particular, this location is Kor's Geode, uh, which is located in the Broken Teeth Mountains of Ashtar on the continent Terra uh, It is a city of dwarves uh, with eight, about 8,500 souls living in it. And it was built in this enormous underground geode uh, to harvest the huge supply of amethyst and quartz crystals that are growing on the inside of that geode. So I'm kind of ticking down the list here, if you can follow along with the checklist up here as we go. Um, Architecture-wise, the dwarves aren't particularly imaginative. They're more utilitarian with their architecture, at least that's how it goes in my setting. So they, on the floor of the geode, there's a layer of sand, and they've built cut stone uh, houses out of cut stone slabs on the floor of the geode, or just carve them into tunnels off of the sides of the geode's walls. It's ruled by a dwarven lord, uh, who basically can, has total control over the inhabitants of the city. Um, this is pretty typical of, of dwarven settlements uh, in a lot of settings, really, but Teradar also. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, how does it feel, though? Well, it's a big underground geode, and we're talking in a... An enormous geode. Um, oh, I should probably... I was looking at the Pathfinder settlement stuff, but uh, like I said, I'm not doing anything system-specific this time, but uh, I'm going to see if I can get some... So this is what a geode is. If anyone doesn't know what a geode is, uh, here's a good example of a, of a one large enough for a person to stand into at rather low resolution. Um, but this is the kind of the idea we're working with here. So the concept is one of these amethyst line geodes that is hundreds and hundreds of meters across, uh, large enough for an entire small city of dwarves to be living inside of it and mining it the inside of the crystal uh, as a raw material to export. So that's what the idea we're going with here is. 
That can be closed now. Yes, close tabs. Sorry. Um, so that's the idea we're going with here when I talk about a geode line with amethyst. This is what I'm talking about. These purple gemstones, um, they're uh, made of silica, uh, but what, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, they're gemstones and they often, uh, they're chemically almost the same as quartz. Uh, so we said it's got a huge supply of amethyst and quartz and that's what it's here to do. Inside this geode, there's an enormous underground open space. So even though you're underground, the city itself feels very spacious. It's always nighttime and it's always lit with this dim purple glow uh, uh, from the purple crystals that line the walls and, and the lanterns built into the walls to illuminate everything. So it, it's a rather unearthly place to be inside. Um, that's probably what I would use if I were describing this to players. I would say, you know, there's an unearthly purple glow that suffuses everything um, outside of the houses and things like that. Um, so it's ruled by a lord. Um, it's martial law. So there is a city guard who are responsible both for military defense and for keeping order within the city. Uh, and because it's a mountain home, it's a box underground, uh, it's a natural fortress and it's got enough food stores to withstand siege for years. So what's going on here? Well, there's this miners' guild, which has a tremendous amount of influence. Uh, they basically run the show. Um, the government's not overly corrupt. They're not really evil per se. It's just mining is really the thing that goes on in the city. So that's the most important organization, really the only other organization that's operating here. There's no mages' guild. There's no uh, crime gangs per se, or at least none that are that I've chosen to note uh, for the purposes of the campaign I'm running. Um, Imports, exports, as you'd expect, it's an underground hole, so they have to bring in food, clothes, and equipment, and they export raw amethyst, gemstone cuts, and carved goods. It probably brings in a pretty penny. The landmarks, this is where you really get into like the important things that the players have to notice. So when we talk about landmarks, we really talk about things that the players will definitely wind up seeing when they're there. In this case, there's the Lord's Keep, which is literally suspended from chains from the ceiling of the geode above the city. Uh, it's where the Miners Guild keep their most valuable possess their valuable goods. So you, that kind of just by ex when the players learn this piece of information, they'll quickly learn that the Miners Guild, okay, they have in, they're in bed with the city's rulers because they've got this space in this enormous hanging fortress. Um, it also kind of sets the mood of kind of uh, you know an Orwellian theme like the 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 rulers of the city are physically above you, not just socially above you. They actually are looking down on you uh, and can throw their shit on you if they want to. Um, and to get to it, it's very dangerous. You have to go up the stair on the cavern wall and then take a bridge across the void from the cavern wall to the entrance of the fortress. Um, so it's very, very strongly defended. Um, lastly, this is kind of an extension as far as I want to get, really want to go with the game rule specific stuff. Uh, is the idea that a city has an effect on people's skills. So this could be um, something like an abundance of raw materials, making it easy to use crafting skills. This can be something like racism. Uh, in this case, I've gone for the racist tone, mountain dwarves, um, because the city is inhabited by mountain dwarves, they get advantage when making skill checks to interact with the local dwarves. Um, basically kind of the dwarven gruffness, you know, where you they tend to not be particularly good at talking with people. Well, they can talk amongst their own people just fine. So we actually give them uh, advantage to that. And if you have a mountain dwarf in the party, you'll have an easier time uh, negotiating with them. Um, I could go the other way with this, right? We can say, you know, well, dwarves tend to not like elves, maybe. So we would have elves in the party, regardless of how charismatic they are, being at a disadvantage uh, when doing kind of chatty skills like intimidate or diplomacy or... Uh, uh, investigation, things like that. Um, so whatever, this isn't really tailored to any one particular plot thread, so whatever kind of you think might be going on in the city, you can kind of make a note of it on skill effects. And then when your players sit down to the table and you're actually in the city, uh, the dwarf, you can, you can either mention that, you know, this, because the city is inhabited by mountain dwarves, you know, you, and I look to my dwarven player, uh, will have an advantage when talking to the locals. Maybe you should be speaking up for the party. And that person will be like, okay. And uh, they get a chance to be kind of, and they, they get something where they'd be important uh, in a way that they might not normally be important, which I think is a good thing for player characters in general is the idea that from time to time, they get an opportunity to excel that they weren't expecting. They get an opportunity to kind of be in the spotlight. 
we are getting on quite a tangent here. So, uh, can everyone in chat, uh, if you're in chat and just want to say hi and want to participate in the asking of, answering asking questions, uh, just go ahead and say hi in the chat uh, so I can make sure everything's working. Uh, and there is a 20 second lag on anything posted to chat. So uh, if you ask a question or make a suggestion, there will be a lag before I can respond to it. Okay. So we're going to start off now with uh, a city from the actual from the actual campaign setting we're do doing. Uh, we're going to start off with an actual city. We're going to start with Vrasta. So, do 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 do. do. Vrasta. Um, so with the player. Characters are going to be arriving in Vrasta um, by rail. Um, it's kind of the how this whole thing gets started is they're on a train journey, so they wind up coming into the city of Vrasta by rail. Um, it's going to be located. Let's pull up the map. So we haven't actually put Vrasta on the map yet because we are still kind of deciding what the city is like. But I want to put it kind of in this foothills area, not far from the desert, is where I'm thinking of putting it. Somewhere around this intersection, maybe. I will be drawing a better map of this at some point. Maybe I'll do that on next week's stream. We'll just have a nice, quiet, uh, chill down and, and uh, drawing some maps. So it'll be about here, I'm thinking, um, in the mountain foothills. And that will tell the fact that it's in mountain foothills will kind of help us inform us about um, what the place is going to be like. So I'm going to put it in the western, in the southwest, western foothills. in Kazal. Population. So we talked about this being a city. So population can be generally anywhere from like six or eight thousand up to well about twenty thousand, twenty five thousand around that. Um, so let's take a look. So it's on the rail line so it's clearly important. It's on this very important major rail line. So it has it will probably be a large-ish city at least. Not perhaps as large as a city that's on the coast. Uh, coastals, the largest settlements are historically always going to be on the coast. So let's put it at around, I'm going to close this one because I don't need it right now. Uh, let's put it at around 15. Let's do 15,000, I think. This number almost does not matter at all, really. Uh, the city, you know, will be as large as it feels. Um, so the reason for existing, this is, this is a question... Uh, I think a lot of people don't ask when they want to uh, make a city for their storyline is, why is this city here? What was it founded for? What did the people who built the city uh, mean to build it for? What were the first settlers here doing? Uh, what do you think, chat? Any suggestions for why is the city here? Keeping in mind, it is in the foothills near the mountains and near the desert. Um, I'm thinking maybe mining. But uh, we already had one mining town, so maybe this town uh, serves a more different purpose. Any suggestions from the chat? Just have to give chat uh, a few seconds to catch up here now. Okay, sorry for that dead air. Uh, let's go with uh, let's go with that. It is um, let's say that there's a river here because it's in the foothills, so maybe they've got easy access to water. We'll add in a river later. Um, built along a river, um, so it's got access to water, which means it's well, it makes sense for a city not for a city to be there at all now. Um, and let's say their main thing is that they have a large smelting business. So instead of the mining town, we've kind of moved up the uh, food chain now. And it's now a smeltery um, 
from processing raw ore coming from the nearby mines. Chad is also suggesting maybe since they have fresh water, they ship fresh water into the desert. And that's an actually a good point. We have this desert right here, so maybe it's a dual purpose. Um, or rather, maybe its purpose has uh, evolved. It was founded um, for one purpose, but since there's perhaps trade going through the desert now, um, it's also a or a uh, so it's one end of a desert trade route, uh, which means it supplies traders going through the desert. Um, which works nicely. Um, things like uh, having trade caravans going around, it's kind of a classic uh, a classic trope for an adventuring party is there are a bunch of caravan guards. Uh, it's an easy way for a lot of lobby uh, kind of adventurers to get their start, right? Is like guarding the passage of goods through potentially dangerous territory. So that might work too, and that kind of sets up a bit of the feel for it now. Okay, so we got these two, we got these two, these two things going on, right? We have this smeltery, um, where ore delivered probably by train from the mountains uh, gets dropped off to be turned into uh, metal ingots um, that can then later be used to make material to make stuff. Uh, and it's got desert traders who are coming and going, uh, bringing stuff across this desert to God knows where places further west. Um, I like this arrangement. I think this uh, was a pretty good... The, having the two industries uh, really makes it a better case for this being a large city rather than just like a single little village or something like that. Um, and it makes more sense now for things to be the way they are. So it's got access to rail, which helps ease the flow of goods. It's got access to this... It's on this desert trade route, possibly because of its rail or because of the spring, the, the river that it's got access to. I think this is good. This is a, a believable city. One thing I always like to do with my uh, campaign setting, in from, uh, the details I add, is to make things believable. Try and make it, you know, feel like this world could exist almost even in the absence of the magic that tends to pervade it, right? You have all this magical stuff, but ultimately you need to be, you know, there has to be industry, there has to be things going on that people have to be wanting to do. So um, that brings us to... Uh, more about making this feel real, which is the architecture. Architecture is a tricky thing, and I mean, there's a it's a whole discipline unto itself. But we, for the purposes of storytelling, we really just need to be able to describe what do the buildings look like, what are they made of, um, for instance. So we talked about with Core's geode, right? That the buildings are, it's underground, but in this big open space. So the buildings are made of cut stone slabs or just carved into the walls. Here, uh, it's more likely that we're just going to be looking at uh, wood and tim at, uh, timber structures, maybe a bit of stone construction, um, basically out in the open, a rather, a rather typical, um, a rather, t rather typical construction for this kind of uh, uh, early industrial setting that we're going with. Remember that this is not your standard late medieval setting we're dealing with. This is an early industrial setting, um, so you're going to see lots of stone construction. Um, but also still quite a bit of wood. So uh, let's see here, uh, um, stone and metal construction. Uh, so we've got, we're gonna have a few different kinds of buildings here. Let's just make a, a few sub bullet points. Um, we're gonna have, let's see, uh, in the mountain, so, um, So, I mean, the simple wooden cobblestone foundation wooden houses are probably still going to be the, prev the prevalent type place people are living in. Um, you know, very quaint. Uh, um, we're going to have the nicer houses, though, are going to be, um, br we're going to have brickwork. So, like, kind of Victorian, almost, I don't know. Um, So we'll have brick for some of the nicer places, uh, and then the and then since we we again we're doing an industrial setting, so the largest f factories, the biggest buildings, 
uh, will have metal beams. And this is going to be like the, uh, uh, this is going to be, you know, the, uh, So picture, 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 a, you know, an, an, uh, industri an industrial, like picture a proper, just a factory building and you probably think of like a box with metal beams and like windows along one side or at least that's kind of what I think of. And I think we're going to go with that for kind of, for the largest of the factories. And then majority of stuff is going to be um, red brick with some uh, simple, uh... so now we've got these notes. And now when we want to go and describe uh, the city or describe an individual structure um, to the party we can we have this we can go we can draw off of we can just say oh the the alchem the alchemist shop is in a red brick building um, attached to three other shops somewhere in the center of town that kind of thing so feel this is the kind of atmosphere of the place uh, we talked about with Cor's geode it was an underground and spacious thing I think I want to say bustling is the word we're just going to use here, really. So, uh, we got a smeltery. They're probably going to be burning coal. It's going to be dirty. It is going to be like covered in soot and polluted and uh, nasty to breathe and stuff like that. Um, uh, we might add. We'll add some more bullet points to feel once we kind of, as we kind of work our way through the city, uh, work our way through our bit of urban planning here, a bit of urban design. How is this governed? That's a question I will ask. We haven't talked much about the actual governance of Kazal yet. Um, there's no real notes in the. Or let me see what we got in the region notes actually. Pull up the region notes. What do we know about Kazal? Right, this was the place where basically business owners could literally own entire cities or towns if they want to. I think a larger city like this, maybe not uh, so much, but there's a not very powerful central government. So, um, we have an early industrial situation uh, with a weak central government um, so it could just be as simple as saying the city is, you know, um, so I mean, it's part of the nation, part of the Kazal nation. But how is the city actually ruled? Is it a council? Is it a mayor? Is it still a, you know, hereditary lord? What do we think, chat? Well, wait for chat to catch up. Let's talk about crime for a second here. Um, it's a big trade port, so crime is going to be rampant. I'm just coming up with a few details. So like the traders, because they're outsiders, they get ignored maybe um, by the local enforcement because they'll be gone by the time, you know, any enforcement uh, comes through. Um, and we'll say that the... Um, what do I want to say? Um, poverty, I guess, would also probably be pretty rampant. Not a nice place, not a nice place. So we have a suggestion from chat that this place is governed by a hereditary lord, um, but someone who is mostly powerless. Uh, I, I like that, kind of a lame duck, he's saying. Uh, and now we get to pull in a detail that we worked on last week when we were talking about factions. 
we know that the Bronze Cog Cartel uh, operate largely in this area and they own many of the businesses around here. So I'm going to say that the Bronze Cog Cartel actually hold quite a few of the keys to the city, um, so to speak. So we're going to say that they basically got all the power because they control one of the city's two industries. Um, 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 so I think we, we can give the hereditary lord some authority at least. Um, we can say he's more in, he's more interested in the trade business, uh, and he's quite intentionally staying out of the smelting business. Um, so now we're kind of tying it into this kind of idea of the dual purpose city of this place. Uh, this is a large enough city that it probably doesn't have martial law. It probably actually has a dedicated police force. Um, but we'll say that they're frequently at odds with the cartels enforcers uh, in the district, in the like industrial districts. So we've got kind of this tension, right? We've got the, the, the you got the, the cartel zone enforcers who, you know, and the police show up to investigate something, just like, no, 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 forget about it, forget about it, go, go on. And so we, uh, we got this nice, we got this nice kind of, kind of unsettling here that really, really it is the, the cartel that controls this town. Uh, and we'll probably come back and make this a plot thread unto itself later, but I like that this is kind of becoming a subtext here, at least for the area of Kazal, is the fact that this cartel actually runs everything and they're not exactly nice people. Like, we, we established, basically, that the cartel is a neutral evil organization, um, basically bent on making money uh, through any means, uh, keeping the goods flowing and keeping the competition out uh, is what they're all about. So they're like... You know, they're, 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 it's a well-known trope, kind of the skeezy business owner, and we're totally doing that with this cartel. Um, so defense-wise, um, this is a city, it's, it's a frontier city because it's on the desert, right? So it's going to have uh, some kind of permanent military presence also, maybe uh, just a small detachment. Um, So I'm putting this detail in here that the base on the outskirts is much larger than necessary. <coughs> um, this is an important detail because one of the plot threads that we've got going here, kind of a background plot, is that Kazal is preparing to go to war with Alvilda over the... Um, so Kazal and Alvilda here are preparing to go to war against each other over control of these two territories in between them, the Mountains of Metal and the Dagger Shore Vale. Uh, we kind of established this uh, a few videos, uh, probably a month or two ago now, that this is going to be kind of a plot thread that's going on, and if the players don't intervene, they are going to go to war, and the players will get an opportunity to intervene later on in the storyline um, to try and prevent that from happening. Um, if they so choose to, you know, pay attention to the storyline and actually follow it through. Um, so we want to say that they've that Kazal has has set up a larger base here than is necessary, um, but say no more right now. We're not going to tell the players what the implication is. Let them draw their own conclusions if they want to, um, and then obviously later on in the storyline when we start massing troops, um, Vrasta here will go from a bustling trade hub to 
suddenly there's you know a thousand soldiers in town and the the smelteries are all busy hammering out swords uh, and spearheads and the like and so we we kind of we're putting the pieces on the board is what we're doing we are we are putting the pieces on the board for our game of chess that is our story that we're going to tell um, so that when we turn around and come back to this it's party time basically it's go time um, Uh, if chat wants to make any other suggestions for kind of ways to help add details to Vrasta, I'm definitely open to hearing them. Uh, so for other organizations, I think we're good right now with just the, the kind of the government, the military, and the bronze cog cartel, and the traders. Um, we don't need necessarily another guild. Um, So I'm going to put in possible union movement. We're, we're still early industrial, so it's not quite, if we follow the real world's timeline, it's not quite the right time for us to be coming up with, like, you know, Karl Marx wouldn't uh, be around yet. So with the terms of, you know, union uh, socialism and workers' rights and workers' control and all that, we're not quite there yet, but we're in the conditions that would lead to the rise of that. Um, so perhaps there is a unionization movement uh, we might make that a faction later on. We might actually make, set them out as a faction and have them be players in the kind of the side story. Because remember, we have our central story, which is the these ma the magic mirrors that are causing bits of other planes to break through uh, onto Prime. But then we're gonna have all the we're gonna have you know two or three usually kind of side plots that can give us side quests from time to time, or it could be things going on in the world <coughs> around the main story. So we're at the 30 minute mark here, and I would like just like to say that anyone who's joined us um, has started watching in the last half hour. This is an interactive podcast, so if you log into Twitch and you can join the chat, and uh, you're welcome to make suggestions and help me kind of figure out how this world is going to go. This is a collaborative effort. Also, if anyone's not quite sure what's going on, you are highly encouraged to check out the YouTube channel. Um, link is below the video, and that will help explain kind of what's going on. Um, you can watch my back catalog and see how this world has been evolving slowly over time. I just realized I have the wrong title on here still. Um, oopsie. So I have the wrong title on the Twitch stream because we're not creating factions anymore. We're creating cities. Uh, so I'll just update that. All right. So the Twitch channel stream should be updated. Obviously, on, if you're watching on YouTube, don't worry about any of that because this has the correct title now. Um, so yes, uh, you're more than welcome to uh, contribute to chat uh, by helping answer questions. So what are its imports and exports, other than the parts we already know about? We already know that What is the main thing that the people coming through the desert are trading, chat? Tell me that. What are the desert travelers trading? They're coming from somewhere over these mountains. This is really wild, undefined territory. Uh, and they're coming all the way across the desert, probably on their way to either this railroad or the sea, to trade something. What are they trading? And while I wait for chat to catch up... Uh, I'm just going to add a few landmarks here, kind of the things we've alluded to, like the, the smeltery smokestack being seen from all over the city. Uh, um, the train station, obviously, because that's how the party are going to arrive um, in town. Um, so what, what's coming across the desert chat? Any suggestions? Any suggestions at all? Uh, it's kind of a, if anyone here is watching on YouTube later on, this is gonna this today's been kind of a slow day for chat, so uh, apologies. I can always come up with stuff if uh, no one wants to suggest things. That's cool too. Um. So the smokestacks, train station. Um, we're gonna also have a probably a trading hall of some kind. Uh, 
Let's see. We have a session of sand. <laughs> um, actually, so thanks for thanks for that thanks for that suggestion, uh, Loon KJ. Uh, we have a smeltery here, and we have sand. We can make glass. So let's say that they export glass in addition to uh, the smelted metal that we said they're exporting. You see, it's just the simplest, simplest idea, you know. Well, they got sand, yeah, and maybe, uh, maybe, maybe they, they actually collect that sand. Maybe they harvest it, uh, grade it, and make glass. Uh, probably have something else coming over the desert, too, uh, if anyone wants to just suggest. Remember, this is not what's leaving the city so much as what the traders are bringing through the city. Um, so uh, we can do some examples from the classical Silk Road. They can be bringing, you know, silk, spices, tea, um, this sort of thing from areas um, to the northwest across, on the other side of the desert. Maybe that's the best way to get them still. Mm -hmm. um, pepper, sugar, things like that are also possible. Um, so I'm going to put in spices as a... So that's a case of it's imported and immediately exported again. Um, but usually stuff will trade change hands here, right? You have the desert, you have the traders who are good at coming across the desert, coming and going, and then uh, you have the traders who are good at coming across the land, uh, like the, the the coming across the highlands to the sea or coming by rail. The goods are going to trade hands. So you're not going to have the same people carrying their merchandise all the way. Um, you know, from where it's made to where it's going. It trains his hands quite a bit. And so that's where we have this trading hall as kind of a major p focal point for that trade business. Um, and lastly, we're going to have a, you know, the city hall is not even going to be a landmark. I think it's just going to be one another, another one of the buildings. So the last detail we have to come up with for Vrasta here is going to be um, this, if there's going to be any skill effects, any modifiers applied um, to the party for being in this city, um, or any conditions that might apply to the party uh, for being in the city. So we talked about how at Kors Geode, my, uh, the example I put up here, um, we said that the mountain dwarves are kind of racist, and but when they're talking to their own kind, they're really friendly, and so they give it, you get advantage if you're a mountain dwarf uh, and try to talk to locals. The idea being to encourage the character who normally, the player who doesn't normally have to speak for the party, um, to give them an opportunity to kind of speak up and represent the party, um, because it would be advantageous to do so. Maybe uh, we don't need to necessarily have skill effects like this uh, affecting every affecting everything, and they can be kind of vague too. Like you know, we can just put on like. Uh, You can just say that even, just say that, you know, this one crafting skill is easier to use here um, because there's a bunch of materials, right? It doesn't have to be magic, it doesn't have to be special, it can just be, you know, logical almost. Um, so that, that's kind of the thing, we're, that's kind of the, the deal we're going on with skill effects here. So any suggestions from the chat? Uh, I'll go through and take a look at the rest of this here, see if there's any details that are missing. <laughs> uh, 
All right, well, I'm not hearing anything from the chat, so uh, let us continue on then. There's one other kind of detail we might want to come up with, uh, which is who are these, who is important? Who are important people in this town? We talked about how, um, we had talked about, talked about how, players, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what am I looking for here? The Vrasta authorities, who are the Vrasta authorities? Who is the person that they are going to say, this person has offered a reward for the live capture of the angel going berserk in that other location. Um, yeah, I'll add this too. Um, I'm going to say that it's going to be this hereditary lord. Uh, he's probably the one who's got, you know, a good chunk of the cash here. Um, And we're going to give him a name. Technically, we can have the name after the city. That's a, you know, something you would do in a traditional thing is the ruler of the place would be can be named after the place. So he is the Lord of Rasta. Um, regardless of what his name was prior to becoming the Lord of Rasta, he is Lord of Rasta now. But uh, I don't like doing that. I think that's kind of dull. Um, so what's his name going to be? His name is going to be... Uh, naming things is tricky. No questions here. I like to sit down and think and try and work through a few names in my head, try and say them dramatically even. Uh, Lord Varen. Not spelled with a Y. Lord Varen. Varen? Varen? Lord Varen. There we go. Um, and that's all we need to say so far is um, he's the hereditary ruler. Uh, let's see here. He's generally. Generally capitulates to the bronze cog, um, but uh, Charles Trey. So there we go. He controls the trade, uh, going through the, the trade and tax through the city, except for the bronze cogs interest. They don't get taxed. Um, needless to say, he is super corrupt. Uh, he is super corrupt and somewhat ineffectual. In ah, there we go. I can write reasonably well. Seriously. Um, so that's the last detail we want to come up with for. Uh, a city, and then if we have more important NPCs, we would add them to this list too, if they're specifically tied to this place, um, rather than being kind of a moving element of, uh, rather than being a moving element to the city. But I think that's it for now. We just need a name basically to put on the order that gets passed out, saying, you know, Lord Varen has Lord Varen has decreed that uh, anyone who brings him safely this berserk angel from the next town over uh, will be rewarded handsomely. And that's kind of gives us our nice plot hook to go on and go to the next town. Um, see, we got about 15-ish minutes left in the stream for tonight, so I'm thinking I'm going to go on to the next town. Uh, rather satisfied with Rasta. Um, I want to get away from the V's now. We've done two things with V's in their names. Um... Town of Nassar? I don't know. I'm just pulling. I'm just pulling letters and syllables out of my head here. Nassar. The town of Nassar. Uh, don't worry about spelling. Uh, 
Let's do this. Okay, let's go through this here, but I'm going to shoot through this kind of fast now. This is a smaller town, which means it probably needs less details, but uh, uh, let's see here. We're going to put it in the desert on the edge of the mountains. And we're going to give it a really small population, population of only 2,000. Actually, probably less than that even, hell. Uh, get my good scaling numbers for a small town. Doop, 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 doop. Doop, 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 doop. You want a town or a village? Oh, I'm going to do it like... I'm going to give it maybe... Let's make it even smaller. Let's do 700. 700 people. Tiny town. Tiny, tiny town. Uh, it's going to make it a village. If you want to be technical, it's a village, not a town. I don't like being all that technical. But the village of Nassar sounds just as good, so let's do it. Reason for existing, um, it's on an oasis. Done. Uh, if anyone in chat wants to throw out better ideas than this, go right ahead. I'm just kind of rushing because I wanted to get through both of these things before. Uh, I run out of my stream for this evening because I always do try and keep these inside an hour. Um, just inside one hour is usually the length for these streams. Um, architecture, it's going to be sandstone. Sandstone and timber. Uh, And they're all going to be one story uh, or less. So it's a low lying. Feels dry. But the people are friendly. And traders rely on this place and it's kind of it's a bit of a it's a bit of a kind of a meeting place of sort I was gonna say he's technically he's technically not a lord, but everyone treats him like one. But I think we just have a village elder um, who is a vassal. So we've got some remnants of feudality still here, um, right? The village belongs. To the village the ruler of the village is a vassal of the ruler of the larger city in the region. So um, this is effectively like a province now more or less, uh, a province governed by uh, Lord Varin, which, you know, maybe that's what it shakes out to be once we, you know, we can always revisit and add more detail later. Um, anything that's not, you know, said or written down yet isn't, it is open for interpretation and adjustment later on if need be. Um, this place peaceful basically you say remember the the, 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 the the nasar here the nasar is not the point of the story that's going on near nasar nasar is having a problem with a freaking angel who is running berserk and attacking people um because of the effects of the magic artifacts that are going on so we really just need to throw it to hammer in a few details here so that if the players ask questions <laughs> Or if you come back here later, or if you just want to feel like describing stuff in great detail and being verbose about it, um, you're prepared for it. A lot of DMing, at least with my style of DMing, a lot of it is kind of over-preparing for stuff, or at least 
writing more, writing far, far more than you expect to ever actually use so that when things go off the rails or when someone asks a question, you can come up with an answer quickly uh, without breaking immersion, without saying, well, I don't know because we haven't figured it out yet, or it's not written down here, so I don't know what it is. To be able to just ad lib and come up with an answer um, you know, within a set couple of seconds of being asked at the table is really good for keeping the players in the game and feeling like this is a lot living, breathing, live world. Um, but as a result, you have to kind of over-engineer stuff and put in these details that probably are never going to be actually referenced or used at all. But they're just there so that you've got a clear picture in your mind, okay, this town is like this. And this kind of helps paint it so that when, like, a month from now or whatever, when I'm actually running this campaign, uh, and the player, one of my players asks me a question, you know, just like, well, who runs this? Who's in charge here? And I can say, well, there's a village elder... Uh, and you can go off and find him, uh, or, you know, things like that. Um, this is a, the town itself is a valuable asset to the traders, so if there's a problem, um, the traders will assist, in this case, a rampaging angel. Um, but the town is really lightly defended, and so it's, you know, it's going to need help, and that's where the party, adventuring party come in. Uh, other organizations, probably nothing. Imports, exports. Um, Landmarks is going to be probably the, the the most notable place would be the like um, the the tavern basically, um, which in this case rather than your traditional like the Red Dragon Inn kind of tavern in slash combo, more likely it's going to be kind of a sandy watering hole where pe where you know half exhausted traders are sitting out of the heat, uh, sipping a glass of water uh, and just generally trying to survive. Skill effects. Um, I'm actually going to put this one up in the other city too, under skill effects. Um, Making learnings about goings on elsewhere easier. What does that mean? That means probably a uh, a passive bonus to investigate if we're doing fifth edition. So do like uh, like a plus three or four or whatever to investigate. Uh, that make, means you know if you're looking for information about what's going on. Uh, these traders are more than likely going to be able to tell you some interesting stories. Whether or not they're true, well, that's for the DM and the players to work out. That's one of the things you work at at the table. Right, so we're near the end of the, tonight's stream. Uh, I'm going to say that the all, um, all this will eventually be posted to my blog once it's more finished. Um, link for the blog is below the video, be, be you watching on Twitch Live or later on on YouTube. Um, there's a link to the blog uh, where all this will eventually be posted. So if you're watching on YouTube, go check it out because it might be up. Uh, I don't know. We'll see. Um, you can use any of the stuff I've created uh, as part of your own campaign if you want to. This is all Creative Commons 4.0 attribution, which just basically means you can take what I'm doing and use it however you like, but you have to give me credit. Also, I would like to know if you're using it so that I can give you a shout out and generally help help collaborate or clear up any questions you may have. So if you want to use any of this, little bits of it, or the whole thing, or whatever, um, feel free to shoot me a tweet, and I will give you both a shout-out here on the stream and be willing to answer any questions you have. So um, that's it for the Creating Cities episode. Uh, 
Good night, Twitch. Good night, YouTube. Please remember to follow, subscribe, like, whatever it is, whatever knobs and switches uh, you wish to click. I do appreciate it. Good night, everyone. Bye.